Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. On behalf of ASEA, I'd like to welcome you to this Connected Car event. My name is Cathy Smith. I met you, some of you, last year. I'm going to be the moderator. I'm sure that it's not the first time that ASEA has held an event in Auto World, because it does sort of make sense. But I have to say that when you see all those wonderful old cars out there and then you think about what we're discussing today and just imagine what those drivers would have made of this discussion and what those manufacturers would have made of it, it's quite incredible. But it's incredible, but it's real, because as we know, the connected car is very much here. I think, is it about 8% of cars are already connected and it's moving very, very quickly. It's not that simple, but I think in this interconnected world, nothing is that simple. But uh, quite clearly, there are huge advantages of having a connected car. There are some issues to sort out, but we are going to talk about those today. I'm not suggesting we'll have all the answers by the end of the afternoon, but two big questions. Is the connected car the magic solution for safe and clean mobility? And connection versus protection? how to strike the balance, that those will be the themes of our two panel discussions later on. And we want, obviously, as much interaction as we can get. We want questions from you. Um, you've seen that, that there is a, a hashtag, a Twitter hashtag, which is a hashtag connected car. Is it, if everybody is online, um, it's auto Minerva, and then the password is auto world in small letters. Auto world is the password. Um, we are also str streaming this event live, so hello to anyone who is watching from their office or can't be with us today. So also people who are watching outside can, can tweet in some questions. So we're already getting one or two tweets in, um, and it's a good way to ask questions, but obviously we will also have microphones in the audience. So to start in earnest, I'd like to pass you over to your real host, Eric Janard, who is the Secretary General of ASEA. Eric. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, let me on my turn welcome all of you here at Auto World and, and warmly welcome you here. I hope that the debate later on will uh, warm everybody up because it's a bit cool here. So you will have to warm yourself up during this afternoon session. And I'm sure you will with your engagement and active participation throughout uh, this afternoon. We are really very proud to be able to set up this event on the connected car because we all know there has been a lot of talk about connectivity, about connected cars recently, especially in the media, and there's also quite some confusion about the topic. Everybody has given it its own description, its own meaning, and one of the objectives of this afternoon session is to start clarifying a bit what we actually are talking about. Try to define what we mean by connectivity, what we mean by connected cars. But before, let me uh, obviously welcome some special guests we have here this afternoon. First of all, my president, uh, Mr. Carlos Ghosn, CEO of Renault. We hope to expect in a couple of minutes uh, the Commissioner uh, for uh, Digital Economy and Society, Gunther Oettinger, as well as the Director General of DG Move, Mr. Machado. They will join very soon. Because it's important that we use this opportunity to hear also the perspective of policymakers. As you will hear, the conversation this afternoon will highlight the need for continued investment in innovation and in infrastructure when it comes to connectivity. We as an industry are eager to have a supportive, predictable framework that enables both manufacturers as well as suppliers to provide the best possible connectivity experience to our consumers, our customers, to the drivers. And the subject of innovation, investment in infrastructure, is going to hopefully also be 
high on the agenda during the Competitiveness Council, which is meeting in Brussels today and tomorrow. Now, the benefits of providing a widening package of automotive connectivity technologies are clear. It's going to be all about making sure that the vehicles, the cars, which you are bringing to the market are safer, are cleaner, are safer and more secure. But, besides all the opportunities triggered by this new technology, there are obviously also some challenges. And we want to use especially the panel discussions later on to identify those challenges and to have an open exchange with different stakeholders about how we best address those challenges. I don't think we have right now all the solutions in our pocket. We need a discussion, an open debate with all key players to see how we best progress on these challenges. So, let me conclude. I invite you to relax, keep warm, get comfortable, and, and be ready to engage in the panel discussions uh, later on. Now I would like to ask your attention for a short video. You know, a visual says more or is worth more, like they say, than a thousand words. So let's visit, let's uh, look at the uh, video to get a better idea of what the topic is of this afternoon, what we really want to focus on. I wish you a very interesting and insightful afternoon. Thank you. safe, clean, and secure. By using information and communications technology, I can talk to my driver, to fellow cars, to the roads, and to others. I'm a minority in the world of cars right now. Only about 8% of cars coming out of factories today are connected in some way. But soon that's all going to change. By 2020, about a quarter of all cars will be online. Most of the technology to get me to talk to other cars already exists, and it helps my driver get from his home to his office more efficiently every morning. I save time and money by guiding him to get from place to place faster, avoiding traffic jams and road hazards, as well as enabling him to work and stay informed on the go. I am more than just a car. With me, my driver is more connected to the rest of the world. I integrate with his mobile phone and other devices to keep him up to date with news, infotainment and his daily schedule. My driver and passengers can even install apps on my onboard computer to adapt me to their needs. Like on a smartphone, these apps can be anything from maps and parking apps for my driver to email clients and games or video services for my passengers. If I need to go in for a service or I need any replacement parts to keep me going, I can alert my driver and even book the maintenance appointment at a local garage. My new connectivity technology is moving the boundaries of what it means to own a car. It also means there are still things to be worked out so that owners can make the best choices as to how to maintain me. Like a computer, I have many complex systems that need to be kept up to date to work properly and I contain a lot of information about my driver that I'd like to keep safe. I also need to be treated with care so that I'm safe from interference with my systems. I wouldn't want anything going wrong while I'm on the move. I am part of a growing network of cars that can exchange information to help avoid accidents and improve traffic flow. The infrastructure I'll need to make the most of my connectivity talents isn't all built yet. But when it is, I'll also be able to talk to things like traffic lights and road signs to find out what's going on. I'll be able to advise my driver about trouble further down the road, as well as unseen traffic jams and speed limits. This will make all of us a lot safer on the road. My connectivity talents means I will be a lot cleaner, particularly in cities. Because I can find the most efficient route, I don't have to stop and start so much. And because I know all the best available parking spots, my driver will spend less time and energy looking for a place to leave me. Connected cars like me will open up a new world of possibilities that will make road transport safer, cleaner and more secure. 
It's a future that's only a few years away. So there you are, you have met the connected car in person. Welcome to the Commissioner. We'll be hearing from Commissioner Ottinger in a moment. Um, already, Auto, well, Auto News Europe are already telling us what's happening next. You see the tweeting is, is happening. That uh, We're going to hear from Carlos Ghosn, who is, of course, uh, the ASEA president and the CEO of Renault. So for our opening address, Mr Ghosn, can I give you the floor? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to ASEA's event on the connected car. Automotive connectivity is obviously an increasingly popular topic in the news media. Yet, while everyone seems to be talking about the connected car, not everyone seems to be talking about exactly the same thing. The automotive industry believes it's important to start by clarifying what we mean when we refer to the connected car. Put simply, Connected cars are those that are able to communicate with each other, infrastructure, drivers, or other parties to provide in order to provide information and services. The purpose of this connected technology is to improve safety, comfort, efficiency, and environmental performance. We also think it's important to clarify what connectivity is not. You probably heard several different terms used interchangeably, which has led to some confusion. Connectivity is not the same as active safety. Active safety systems use in-vehicle sensors to help drivers control a vehicle. These include such features as driver attention assistance, lane departure warning systems, and advanced emergency braking systems. While some of these safety features could be enhanced by connectivity, they do not need to be connected to work. The connected car should also be distinguished from an assisted or autonomous drive car. Some technologies that have uses in connected cars may eventually also be features in autonomous drive cars, but they, are, they have different objectives and they have different principles. The driver still remain in control of the connected car, even though his driving experience has completely changed. I have defined what the connected car is, but what does it mean for the consumer? First, it means driving will become considerably safer. It also means more efficient mobility by reducing unproductive time during driving, such as when you are stuck in slow traffic. We all have in common the need for more time and the ability to make the most effective and pleasant use of that time. As an industry, we can use connected technologies to respond to that need, especially when we consider drivers spend on average in the world two hours a day in, uh, in, in their cars. Connectivity will help make individual mobility more efficient. Connected cars will also make the car an extension of your home or of your office, providing the potential to enhance driving by making it more convenient, productive, time-saving, and less stressful. This is particularly important when we take into account the needs of today's digital generation, which wants to be constantly connected online. They want access to their music, social media, and friends, and they want this access at any place, any time. This means our future cars will need to be as connected as our smartphones and our tablets. Connectivity is changing how people, young and old, use their cars. It is transforming their relationship with the car, which is moving away from that of a master and servant to become a kind of partnership. This will foster an even greater emotional tie with the car. What impact will connected vehicles have on society at large? Uh, for over 100 years, the automobile has transformed modern society by providing freedom of mobility for all. But the widespread demand for mobility has unfortunately come at a cost, with increased congestion, additional CO2 emissions, and accidents. Curbing mobility is not a viable option, so what can be done to mitigate these negative effects? There is no single answer, but through its continued investment in innovative technologies, our industry is committed to be part of the solution. For example, connected vehicles will enhance transport management and efficiency. Connectivity will change the way cars are integrated into our transport, 
transportation infrastructure. It promises to make driving safer, more fluid, and less polluting. In this sense, connected cars are an important part of our response to future transportation challenges. In terms of balancing the ever-growing demand for mobility with environmental protection and increased safety. This is particularly the case in urban areas where connectivity is central to the creation of smart cities. These issues will be discussed further this afternoon in the panel debate on safe and clean connectivity. Connected cars bring many benefits and opportunity, but they also raise some challenges and questions that need to be answered. In a connected car, you'll be able to download apps just like you can for a smartphone or computer. These could pay for parking, provide internet on the go, show the nearest parking spaces, or provide local information instantly. But it's important to ensure what we download, that what we download is safe. We've all experienced what can go wrong when a computer crashes because we've downloaded a virus or malware. We must maintain the integrity of the vehicle and guarantee its safe and secure functioning under all circumstances. This is crucial not only when we install application, but also when third parties communicate and exchange data with our cars. The ability of drivers and third party to interact with the car also requires that we establish a clear chain of legal liability. It's crucial that all involved have confidence in connected vehicle and are willing to invest in them as well as the necessary infrastructure. Connectivity involves exchange of data, so protection of personal data is an issue automakers and anyone else who accesses or processes the data will need to take, to take very seriously. Their reputation could be at risk. Finally, there is the risk of hacking. The ability for vehicles to be connected to the internet means those seeking to do harm could potentially gain remote access to vehicle systems. These issues will be discussed further this afternoon also in the panel deba debate on secure connectivity. I would like to conclude with a few thoughts on what connectivity means for the automotive industry. There is little doubt that increasing connectivity is in our industry future. The market is clearly pushing us into this direction. As we have done in the past century, we will reinvent and innovate our way to the future. We will not be doing it alone. Our industry already is working with technology companies and other players as we embrace connectivity and more advanced concepts of mobility. To continue moving forwards, the car of the future, our industry is developing partnerships with policymakers, universities, infrastructure providers, startup, established tech companies, telecoms, and service providers. This is one of the very reasons why we are here. At this conference, we want not only to set out what connectivity means for our industry, but also to open up a discussion with our partners so that together we can build a future where our cars are connected, clean, safe, and secure. With this in mind, I look forward to an afternoon of robust and constructive debate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. And as Carlos Gorn says, it, it, partnership is obviously going to be a key, isn't it? And partnership with policymakers, which is why we're delighted to have with us um, Gunter Ottinger, the new Commissioner for Digital Economy and Society, not new to Brussels, obviously, the former Energy Commissioner. Um, and so Mr. Ottinger is now going to deliver the keynote speech this afternoon. And we welcome you and thank you very much indeed. Dear ASEA President, dear Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank ASEA, your, our association, for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure for me to join you today in this important connected uh, car event. I will present to you the view and the activities of the European Commission on the connected car, a topic which is of great interest, not only for my directorate general, for communication networks, content and technology, but for the European Commission in a broader context. 
Mobility of people and goods is an essential need of modern societies. Transport is a major economic driver in our EU, creating millions of direct and indirect jobs. The automotive sector, including its suppliers, is one of the engines of Europe's economy. It's a sector which employs almost 15 million people overall. It invests over 20 billion euro per year in collaborative research and development efforts, and in particular in ICT research. Nevertheless, challenges need to be addressed. Our transport systems need to be improved, especially in the areas of sustainability, congestion avoidance, and safety. Ladies and gentlemen, um, intelligent transport systems are the key to success. Technologically advanced solutions can help us meet these challenges. And intelligent transport means connected transport. As many of you will uh, know, the European Commission actively supports the development of intelligent and connected mobility systems. To give but one example, that will contribute to making car mobility safer. The Commission has been very active in promoting e-call. This system, the Pan-European Automotive Emergency Call, is a good example of connectivity between vehicles and the infrastructure that could contribute to save lives. Connected cars will bring numerous advantages to drivers and passengers often much more mundane than what e-call promises to bring. As your president has said, car drivers will receive useful information about traffic conditions downstream, parking space availability, and information about alternative routes or mods in case of congestion. All of this based on real data coming from other cars, other vehicles, and the whole infrastructure. The passenger, not the driver, can be connected to the internet just like as at home or at work. This will help him or he, her relax in Brussels famous traffic jams. The connected car brings advantages to the car industry as well. The connected car is an advanced product. As such, it implies a higher value to be added by the car industry and its suppliers. And it also implies additional services to be developed around the product car by the manufacturers. This will allow a further tailoring of this product towards the needs of the customers of today and of tomorrow. The social advantages of a future in which all cars, infrastructures and travelers are connected with each other are also clear. Our mobility system will become not only safer, but as your president has highlighted, more efficient and therefore more sustainable as well. But we do need to get connected mobility right. There is still much work lying ahead of you and ahead of us in a public-private partnership. First of all, connectivity requires reliable IT and telecoms infrastructure, both for safety-related features and for in-vehicle infotainment services. Through the existing 2G and 3G networks will play their role in the initial stages of connectivity deployment. Massive use and sophisticated services will no doubt require significant additional investments. For example, in dedicated short-range communication, DSRC, and broadband. From a technological point of view, we see challenges in assuring cybersecurity if cars are connected to traffic management centers and to the Internet on a large scale. Fair beyond the numbers we currently manage in demonstration 
and pilot projects. The development of an open and interoperable uh, in vehicle platform to enable connectivity and to enable the driver to select the services and the service providers of his or her choice is key to success. Cars of different makes have to be able to communicate with each other and with the infrastructure wherever they are located in Europe. Interoperability creates trust and ensures that consumers and producers are willing to invest in adopting or in developing a new technology. Robust built-in security and privacy measures is required to allow safe operations and anonymous use. And so from an economic point of view, car connectivity, including all its data generation potential, will certainly give rise to new business models. Not only for the existing players in the mobility sector, also third-party service providers originating from other business sectors might well find their way to the new connected ecosystem to develop innovative services. So another key challenge for you is a clear possibility that ubiquitous connectivity will dramatically change the existing value chain in mobility and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, it's obviously the European Commission has to define its role in view of these challenges. We need to foster the investments in the necessary infrastructure. As stated in the investment plan for Europe that the Commission presented last 26 November, additional investment will target infrastructure including broadband networks and transport infrastructure in industrial centers. It's early days still, but you need to move forward quickly in cooperation with my colleague uh, Burke to look into these um, new issues. Another role we clearly see for us is that of enabler. We do this, for example, in the framework of smart cities. As you know, in smart cities, we seek to connect transport, energy and ICT so that we can provide innovative and sustainable services to citizens while supporting economic growth at the same time. Through our European Innovation Partnership on Smart Cities and Communities, we open the floor to public-private corporations to present and jointly develop their smart city solutions, including those of transport. In response, to our first call for commitments in 2014, we received not less than 370 smart city commitments representing over 3,000 partners. And in addition, we animate initiatives such as the e-mobility forum and the cooperative intelligent transport systems platform gathering public and private stakeholders who are working on matters related to the large-scale deployment of cooperative ITS in Europe and current and future research projects co-funded by the European Commission in our framework of FP7 and our new Horizon 2020 programs. Of course, in that capacity of enabler, we also finance, finance considerable research in 2014 alone in the framework of Horizon 2020 and across three directorate generals. We have launched calls for proposals for transport research encompassing 500 million euro of funding. Research and innovation will help to shape Europe's future mobility and support European industry to develop as market leaders in the global marketplace. And a third role, very traditional for the Commission, I'm sure you all agree, is of course that of regulator, creating a, a coherent 
legal framework throughout our European Union. As the e-call example shows, the European Commission can use these powers to secure the actual deployment of the required tools, for example, when it comes to interoperability requirements. And as I'm sure you will all know, we are indeed working hard to enable interoperability in close cooperation with the European standardization organizations by issuing mandates and through the US-EU uh, Harmonization Working Group. And on this issue, an important step for the connected car deployment was reached in February this year. The responsible European organizations, ETSI and SEN, announced the first set of standards which will help to make connected cars a reality. But other important areas are coming up on our collective radar screen. Uh, with all things digital, data accessibility and privacy issues are certainly become topics of the discussion in the context of the connected car and are issues on which dialogue and action will be required. Ladies and gentlemen, dear President, I'm expecting a swift uptake of intelligent uh, mobility and of the connected car. In a sense, the technology is available. And together we need to get the innovations to real life and to large-scale use. So I also look forward to continue discussions with you regarding the next steps to be taken in the development and large-scale deployment of these connected cars. My door and our door is open to all stakeholders from the industry, from science and from the consumer side interested in these issues. All the best for your next and our next steps and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. So the Commissioner's door is open. I think he's going to get a lot of visitors. Um, you heard there, the he wants to hear the swift uptake of, of the connected car, see the, the swift uptake of the connected car. Um, and the Commissioner's job, of course, as Commissioner Ottinger said, is to be an enabler and regulator, and also to foster investment in, in infrastructure. But of course, it's not just DG Connect that's involved, because there are lots of different parts of the Commission that are involved in this issue. Um, and so, obviously, DG Mobility and Transport clearly involved, DG Move. And we're very happy to have with us for our second keynote speech today, uh, Jao Machado, who is Director General of DG Mobility and Transport. Mr. Machado. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking ASEA for inviting me here today to speak at this event. As to say, this is a great pleasure to me to be here today and to discuss such a challenging topic as the safe, clean and secure connected car. Cooperative systems are expected to contribute to traditional transport policy objectives, such as improving road safety, reducing congestion, optimizing the performance and available capacity of existing infrastructure. But they can also do much more. They can increase travel time reliability, improve the efficiency of logistic operations, and diminish the environmental impacts of road transport. As you know, data and information services are crucial in today's society. They impact people's behavior and mobility patterns. Their potential in enhancing mobility should not be underestimated. From the European Commission perspective, connectivity between road vehicles is not enough. We want to aim higher and have more connectivity in transport as a whole. Innovation 
is an essential dimension to make the single European transport area a reality. We therefore believe that the approach should be broader. In our view, the approach should be more focused on the user. We should not only try to connect trucks and or cars, but also vulnerable road users, pedestrians, cyclists and motorcyclists, as well as users of public transport in an integrated vision. Where do we stand now? Well, the starting point is, of course, research and innovation, and we are already in the execution phase of Horizon 2020. EU's ever larger research and innovation program with 80 billion euros of funding available until 2020, including over 6 billion for transport. Research is already underway to address car connectivity. Now, one could ask the question, why is the Commission so interested in this topic and why would they have an active role in it? The reply is simple. We can achieve much more together than separately. And this is across all stages of research and innovation but also during deployment. This is an important point to make, and the Commission, mandated by the Member States, is adding value in two key areas. First, to engage public and private stakeholders to work together, pooling efforts, budgets and knowledge to define a common approach to move forward. Secondly, to bridge the notorious valley of death, the gap between research and innovation and deployment. Without common efforts, we see a big risk of fragmentation in the EU with a potential expansion of proprietary systems. Having said that, we also know that data is at the heart of cooperative systems. And several issues remain open, as Commissioner Oettinger touched in his previous allocation. First, there are issues related to public acceptance. Do I accept to share my own data in exchange of better services? Secondly, issues related to systems governance. Who is managing the data and for what purpose? And thirdly, security and certification of the system, how to avoid unlawful use of the data. This list is not exhaustive, could be much longer. But now, how will cooperative intelligent transport systems deployment gain momentum? We believe that this is the very moment to serious look at the deployment issues. Where do the enablers stand and how to address the barriers? The deployment of cooperative ITS requires the involvement of stakeholders from different industries and public sector actors and cannot just rely on public funding. A decision to deploy cooperative systems has to be based on sound and convincing business models for all actors in the value chain. In this sense, we have just set up a platform for the deployment of cooperative ITS in the European Union that met for the first time last month. The platform provides an operational instrument for a dialogue, exchange of technical knowledge and cooperation between the Commission and all stakeholders. The platform is expected to develop, in the course of the next 14 months, policy recommendations and proposals for action. We need to get the things done properly. On the basis of this work, our intention is to present a roadmap for deployment, identifying what is to be done by the different parties in order to achieve the targets. 
Further, to funding that is currently being made available through Horizon 2020, the 10T and the Connecting Europe facility, most likely the new actions to be undertaking, undertaken will be a mix of different instruments. This could be, for example, legislation, innovative financing, PPPs, or joint procurement. And last but not least, we should bear in mind that cooperative systems will not solve everything and that they must be designed in such a way that there are no safety backlashes in terms of disengaging drivers from the driver responsibility. Where are we today here to discuss, we are here today to discuss clean cars, as I indicated in the beginning, and is the purpose of this conference. With a recently adopted directive on the deployment of alternative fuels infrastructure with a vision to make transport less dependent on oil and to reduce its environmental impacts, this is now a reality. The EU has provided through this directive the long-awaited legal certainty for companies to start investing and the possibility of economies of scale. Now, it is up for member states who requested more flexibility to develop their rights and national policy frameworks by the end of 2016. And for you, car manufacturers, to propose affordable, cleaner, affordable, fueled cars. The directive is, in our view, a milestone but it only marks the beginning of a long journey towards clean cars. This policy also goes hand in hand with urban mobility, the policy. You will also agree with me, I expect, that current urban mobility situation in the EU is simply unacceptable. The costs of congestion, delays, unpredictable journey times, and the external costs, in particular accidents and air pollution, are simply too high. The answer to this is clear. Improved action on urban mobility is necessary with cleaner cars and new patterns for car use and ownership, but also more walking, cycling, and public transport. Now, let just me make a few words on a in question that is very important, a few just simple words on standardization. In a global market, international cooperation is fundamental for the development of cooperative ITS. In this respect, European organizations cooperate closely with American and Japanese organizations to ensure that the systems are compatible across different geographical areas and that overlapping and competing standards are avoided. Let me now just make some concluding remarks. The challenges ahead are huge, but the benefits that connectivity can bring to the transport sector are equally, if not huge, and can easily be up to the level of the challenges. Obviously, there will be transport benefits to transport users, but also to society at large, in view of increased safety, providing a better use of existing infrastructure, and decreasing environmental impacts. The private sector also benefits from new services and from the improvement of the competitive position of the European industry worldwide. I wish you all a fruitful day and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed to Mr. Machado. So you heard there that the urban mobility situation is unacceptable, according to Mr. Machado, and there are huge challenges ahead, but the benefits 
are equally huge. So that's what we really are going to be talking about now. To set the scene for our panels, we're very happy to have with us um, Frank Levesque, who is the Vice President of the Automotive and Transportation Practice of Consultants Frost and Sullivan. And Frank is going to give us an overview of where we are with the connected car now, where it's being used, just give a few statistics, a sort of a sense of, of where we are, and then we can talk from there. But thank you very much indeed, Frank. Thank you. It is um, an honor to be here today. Uh, thank you, SEA, for inviting me to, uh, to this uh, event. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. So really, you know, connected car is a, is a broad topic um, with considerable ramification and implication across the entire industry. 15 minutes is what I have uh, to, in many ways, uh, summarize 15 years of experience in this, uh, in this, in this area. Um, it is also a unique opportunity uh, for the car manufacturers to regain access to the final customer and to build both more value as well as a stronger relationship with the end user. Connect connectivity. Not yet. Connectivity um, is all around us. Um, connectivity is ubiquitous. Connectivity is a mega trend. It is it reaches far beyond the automotive industry, as was mentioned earlier. Our roadmap must integrate not just 4Gs, LTE, but actually looking much further, looking at 5G, looking at M2M, looking at satellite communication, looking at big data, data analytics, um, data scientists, the next generation of people that we actually need in this industry to build that value where uh, it is required. We have built this presentation here to, um, to, to present a landscape, um, key snippets of the key areas that are important, obviously around the three pillars of safety, clean and secure. When we discuss connected car with safety, one like me who has been involved in this industry for, for, for many years, cannot avoid um, talking about the equal topic. The safety benefits are, are undeniable, but equal has been delayed a number of times and lost, to say the least, momentum, credibility, and edge to a certain extent. Conceptually, it was a no-brainer, but with complex business model technology implications, and moreover, political implication, all in terms of who, is, who should pay for what, what is a business model, and how can it be leveraged? And for this, the necessity to have an alignment between the, the Commission, between the OEMs and the member states. When it was created, ECO was, in many ways, a revolution. Today, it is and should be, I will say, without trying to be too provocative, uh, a prerequisite feature of the connected car. Another critical area of development is vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle. Globally, Japan has taken the lead, having finalized the technical specifications. In Europe, we've had over 20 uh, pilot projects over the past few years, but the breakthrough is now with the first ITS corridor linking Rotterdam, Frankfurt, Vienna, and many more to come. Interestingly, it is actually financed through a PPP, and the first commercial application um, are there for 2016. But again, the business case and the business model is not simple in terms of who and what are the clear benefits um, across the value chain. 
But to me, V2X is especially critical and strategic in the context of autonomous vehicle. In fact, V2X is a key requirement that, um, for anything beyond level two of the autonomous vehicle. If the European um, environment um, wants to be a contender in the race um, of autonomous vehicle topics, then V2X is a must. The second topic that we looked at was clean, or more than clean, smart, efficient clean, to optimize the existing infrastructure. Not reinvent or rebuild the infrastructure, but optimize it. It is estimated that congestion costs over 100 billion euros a year to our economy, not even considering the cost uh, to health due to, position, to pollution. Over the years, we have brought tremendous improvement uh, to the clean technology of our vehicles. But if we spend so much time looking for a parking spot going around the block, well, a lot of this improvement is being wasted. In Paris, just to take an example, it is said that basically 30% of the congestion is due to people looking for parking, 70% as we get to Christmas. This is where people are spending their time instead of actually shopping. So you can have an increase in, 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 um, in spend just by letting, letting them spend more time on the shops and not in their cars. Intelligence is not just about the vehicle. It is also about the infrastructure, bringing intelligence into, the par into parking and key areas of improvement um, and a tr tremendous impact to the environment here as well. Another different topic I wanted to highlight, which is impacting both clean and safe, is user-based insurance, a niche to some, Yes. Furthermore, it also allows vehicle manufacturers to actually target specific customers that tend to turn their back to vehicle ownership because of the price of insurance. It is interesting to me because it demonstrates a multi-layer um, process for the, the business model. There are different models for user-based insurance that are uh, based on mileage or based on driver uh, behavior. But the enabler behind it is connectivity. And the impact is substantial in terms of safety as well as reducing the miles driven. And the most exciting part as well is what we can do with the data, gamifying the data to advise and motivate drivers to actually be more efficient, uh, be safer drivers as well. A boiling topic today in the industry that was highlighted um, and played down to a certain extent um, is that of cybersecurity. And so as connectivity becomes um, more intrusive, it is becoming critical. This is a true concern, and according to our research, we've actually identified over 50 um, areas of vulner vulnerabilities. Um, in many respects, coming from IT background rather than a manufacturing or an automotive um, sort of background, um, Tesla is showing the way there. Um, and the only OEM to have leverage today, OTAs, beyond infotainment, and in many ways, that enables them to actually avoid a costly recall. Still, they know the risk and have invested in Microsoft former head of security to secure that activity. I've invested in numerous um, white hot um, hackers, where white 
had hackers, sorry, um, to support that activity and secure that activity that is core to their, to their strategy. A number of solutions have been evaluated to secure the integrity, the privacy of the data, tampering capacity, which can be clustered around four groups. You have to secure the hardware, uh, secure through the operating systems, secure through uh, software, vir virtualization, isolation of the critical areas, or secure through certification and authentication. At the same time, the most effective and impactful action that a hacker can, may, may take may actually be more efficient tackling or targeting the back end. In fact, um, it is probably as important for vehicle manufacturers and the industry to over-secure as well the, the back-end activity, especially and as well as those um, involved in OTAs, the partners, and the uh, cloud as we are moving increasing amount of uh, activities in that direction. Not tackling this issue is certainly not an option. And I wanted to finish on, on this slide because I believe that the, 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 the key area that has still not been answered is a business model. And we, I, be, I strongly believe that the business model is one that is a little bit like an iceberg. The visible part, those visible areas from a consumer perspective, whether we're talking about infotainment, about fleet management, about eco, about UBIs or um, insurance I was mentioning earlier, and so on and so forth, um, clearly are not sufficiently compelling um, for the consumers to pay for them at a price that is sustainable. Connected car has been the, has the potential to go much deeper and tackle much more strategic business issues in organization. Substantially reduce the cost of warranty has been proven in numerous cases on specific targeted cases uh, by some of you. Improving uh, product development and testing. Optimizing downstream supply chain maintenance repairs that was mentioned a little bit earlier as well improving customer relationship and loyalty. These are some of the, the major areas. Only focusing on the visible part is not sufficient, probably doomed. We've seen that over the past 15 years, but also a substantial waste of the potential that, cost, um, um, that um, connected car can bring to this industry. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was great. A really good insight into what's happening out there. And I love the iceberg of the business model. I think that we'll obviously get to talk about the, the business model um, in our discussions now. I also love the fact that 30% of congestion, congestion in Paris are people looking for parking. I can hardly believe it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just to tell you again that the password, if anyone needs, hasn't managed to get online, is Auto World, the name of the, of the museum, but in small letters, Auto World. So, our first panel, safe and clean connectivity. The question is, is the connected car the magic solution for safe and clean mobility? Something like 26,000 people die every year on Europe's roads. And we all know what's happening in the world of climate change. So we know that, you know, two huge, huge issues which European society has got to face up to. So can the connected car help to solve these issues? Let me introduce our panelists. First of all, Martin Christensen, Director of Connectivity Strategy of Volvo Cars. Martin, you there. Pim van der Nijak, who is uh, Managing Director of Ford Research and Advanced Engineering in Europe. Pim, welcome to you. Would you like to sort of, Martin, if you go there and, and 
him that, thank you. They're not very comfortable, these, but we don't want you to get too comfortable because we want you to talk. Um, Herman Meyer is the CEO of Ertico ITS Europe, which is a public-private partnership to boost collaborative research in intelligent transport systems. Herman, hello to you. From the European Commission, we have Magda Kopczynska, who is Director for Innovative and Sustainable Mobility in DG Mobility and Transport. Hello, Magda. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. And finally, Jacques Anselm, who is CEO of Allianz Telematics, a telematics service provider within the insurance industry. Uh, um, Jacques, you there. Hello. So, please feel free to tweet questions, and also we're going to have uh, microphones going around. But I'm just going to ask you all a couple of questions to begin with to set us, set us off. I mean, I want to really get a sense of what you're already doing in this, in this area um, and the potential you see, but, and then we can, we can broaden out the discussion. But first of all, Martin, um, do you see the connected car as being this sort of magic solution in terms of, of, of safe and clean driving? Wouldn't it be fun if I answered yes to that question? Well, we could all go home and then just <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Well, obviously, it's not a magic solution. It's not a silver bullet, but it, it is a step in the right direction. Um, when uh, we saw some numbers here, about 8% of the cars being connected, actually, uh, almost all of our new cars are being connected. And, and for the next platform, uh, the XC90 that we will start building in a few weeks, all of those cars will be connected. So, so we are actually investing and focusing quite a bit on, on connectivity from Volvo's side. Uh, and there are uh, several reasons for that. One is the, is the customer perspective uh, with apps and services and so on. Uh, another very important aspect is safety. We uh, have been at the forefront of safety for, for forever, basically. So it's not just loading in a whole load of new apps? No, uh, that, not that at all. It's uh, much more than that. And, and are customers actually asking for it? I mean, how, how aware are, are, are drivers of the possibilities? I think that, uh, you know, the definition of connectivity, it's, it's kind of telling, I guess, in, in this domain that I don't fully agree with the definition of connectivity that we heard earlier on. To me, uh, connectivity is a, is a complex subject and so on, but it's still based technology. You know, I don't see the customer paying for connectivity per se. Uh, they're definitely willing to pay for what we use the connectivity for. So you think, I mean, we, we, I don't want to get too deep into the business model yet, but do you think that, that people are prepared to pay extra for a car? With, or, I mean, who, who takes the, the hit? I, I don't see the user paying for us putting a modem in the car. But, for instance, we have a telematic service today that is extremely successful that, you know, almost all of our users in the Nordic markets pick. And the main reasons why people buy that, that's simply uh, to be able to start the heater from their mobile phone. It's one of those you know, key uh, features, or killer features, if you will, that we're able to, to offer through connectivity. So, Pim, can I ask you from the, the perspective of Ford, the same question, really. I mean, is connectivity potentially a magic solution to safe and clean motoring? Again, it's not the magic solution, but it has an enormous potential, especially if we get to 90% uh, of the fleet being connected to each other. But it's still a long way and a long time to get there. A uh, similar story to Volvo, also most of our new vehicles have the connectivity, have the sync system. It enables a lot of apps and, and parking information, parking reservation, and more and more is coming. Uh, as a volume manufacturer with the DSRC connectivity, uh, in the beginning we will still be struggling to sell that to our customers. There will be very uh, little feature content, very little use to the customer, but we need to get also the DSRC units in the vehicles. So to convince the customer, they, they've got to see that there's a real uh, benefit to them. And at the, in, the, in this early stage, there aren't huge benefits. Is that what you're saying? For the DSRC system, there aren't huge benefits. So really, it's uh, necessary. There's more infrastructure coming and, and more use to the customer to really pay that extra money for those units. But the other system, based on seller network, of course, everybody now has a smartphone in the, out, in the car. It's connected to our sync system. And with that system, we can already do an awful lot. But if we want to make maximum use of the, the safety potential of connectivity, then we need to get the DSRC units into the vehicle. 
we heard the Commissioner and other speakers talking about the need for partnership. I mean, do you, is this an area where um, an OEM would have a competitive edge, or do you think that it's actually just something that you really all have to sit around the table and work out together? Because as you say, until it's widespread, there's no benefit to, uh, to a driver. No, and there's also not much benefits of just Ford stock into Ford. So. With the car-to-car -car consortium, we are as an industry working closely together. We all see the potential and we're all pushing forward to get it into the vehicles. Does that actually in involve quite a different mindset in a way? Because you, I presume you're all highly competitive and yet this is something that, that you, you, know, you, you actually will have to get around the table and talk about together. Yeah, but with the potential, especially for safety, uh, we need to work together. The, the, but, uh, the advantage could be in certain apps or certain features, maybe that, that we are first and uh, further uh, first to market and compared to our customers. But on the safety aspects, we just need to get as much units as possible on the road and get them all connected. Okay. Um, uh, surprisingly, enough, uh, surprisingly enough, I actually agree with that. So. Yeah. You do what? I, uh, I agree with that. We need yes. to get along on this subject. Good. Oh, the best friends at the end there now. Um, Herman Meyer from Ertico. Now, Ertico ITS, as we said, it, it, your business is research for intelligent transport systems. So, I mean, you're already working deeply in this whole subject. How much potential is there, do you see? I mean, uh, first of all, I would like to make a, a small correction. I mean, we're not only about research. I mean, for us, uh, the main focus is really on the deployment of the, of the systems. In this context, we do a lot of work concerning the development and also research. Uh, but we uh, currently do most of our work actually in the context of uh, deployment. So you're doing sort of demonstrations and, and you... We do uh, demonstrations, uh, especially in, at the moment in, in cities. Yeah. Uh, I find uh, very important also the statement which was uh, done before concerning the uh, situation in cities. And we believe that uh, most of the benefit which can come from ITS is actually in cities. And um, when you ask me the question about uh, what are the benefits which can be brought about uh, by uh, ITS systems, um, I think many of the systems were already uh, shown before in the presentations and the statements. Um, but one core application is really related to intersections because we see in the intersection uh, situation that uh, this is something which is important in the context of safety so that we have a safer situation in intersections in cities. It is related uh, to also um, the performance concerning mobility that we don't have uh, all these stops yeah? so it also has an impact on, on eco-efficiency. So what and do you mean by intersections? Explain a little bit more. I mean, there, for instance, uh, the technology, what it can provide is that you have a communication between the vehicle and the traffic light. And um, then the traffic light gives information about when it gets green. Then you uh, can adjust your driving behavior accordingly. You get an information, please, if you drive now 40 kilometers, then you will have a green traffic light. Uh, but we would like to go even be beyond. Yeah? We would like to have a situation where then also vehicles exchange information and data with uh, traffic management centers. And then it's not only that there is an optimization of the traffic situation in the context of the traffic light, but in the overall context of the management of the traffic situation in the city. And another very important aspect, which was already mentioned in the context of e-call, uh, we would like to have a situation where when there is an accident, which is a very unfortunate situation, that there not only the, situ uh, the information goes to the next uh, public service answering point, this is important yeah, because then uh, the, the help can come much faster, but immediately the information should also go to the next vehicles so that they can stop and avoid driving into, into this accident situation. And then the information should also go to vehicles which are further away, so that they can still uh, also, if, if they cannot be rerouted, they can at least stop, but they can be rerouted. And the information should also go to the traffic management center again, so that they can adjust their overall traffic management uh, situation. 
And uh, we see that uh, in the context of ITS impact on eco-efficiency, uh, we have uh, made estimations and they showed that all cities have very different situations. So we cannot give uh, figures for, for which, which are valid for all uh, the cities, but we saw that it's between 4 and 25%. What the energy efficiency improvement and CO2 emission reduction. So you've already got that sort of figure that out of some of your projects. These kind of figures we uh, we have uh, for certain applications, which we already tested also in the city environment. So these are not, let's say, the the type of services and applications which will come in 2020. So, so what would it be? What what what? I mean, one one example I gave already with respect to the intersection. Right. But yeah. also in addition. Uh, you get information about uh, road hazard warnings and, and these type of, uh, of things, which also will increase the safety, but also environmental performance of vehicles. So in your mind, there's no doubt then, there's you know, huge advantages in, in this car connectivity. If you would have asked me about magic solution, I would have said, um, I also don't believe it's a magic solution. I think there are major benefits, but first of all, magic solution sounds like it's easy and fast. Yeah. I don't think it's easy and fast. It's very complex. A car is not a smartphone on, two, on four wheels. It's something which you, you... There are many safety considerations which you have to take into account. It's very complex. Uh, the, second, uh, the second issue is uh, that uh, you need... I think it was already mentioned with the, with the, with the business models. Uh, you need to establish very complex business models with parties which have very different interests. Mm. I mean, there are many parties, they don't want to give that, uh, away their data for many reasons. So we have to come up with a very convincing case for everybody who is in the value chain. It's worthwhile to exchange data. It's worthwhile also to provide access to services, it's worth, worthwhile to be part of the overall ecosystem. Yeah? And that is something where I think our main work at the moment within the Artico partnership is on this topic. And therefore, I put so much emphasis on Artico is about deployment. Yes. Artico is about business cases. Artico is about making Europe the most successful place in the world on ITS. Okay, well then, that's a good point to bring in the Commission because um, Magda Kopczynska, that is, a, that is obviously an important point as well as we're talking about cl clean connectivity, we're talking about, about um, safe cars, and I suppose that, you know, it's also good for competition in terms of, in terms of um, Europe holding its own in this area, very important. But tell me just in general terms, I mean, we've heard, obviously, we've already had speakers from the Commission this morning, but, um, do, I mean, is this a sort of a really, really key issue in the midst of your Directorate General? I mean, is this, is this something that um, is exercising a lot of minds at the moment? Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, you heard uh, Commissioner for Digital Agenda and Director General for Mobility and Transport on stage. I think it is sufficient proof that it, it is an important yes, and, topic. And it's, it's true, the fact that the but Commissioner came to the meeting, it's no, true. No, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, relevant to a number of policy areas. But I think um, what we should consider is that and in a way, I'm answering to the question that you haven't asked me whether it is a magic solution. There are no magic solutions in transport. Transport on the whole, no matter which mode we are looking at, is a complex topic. And you can never address transport issues, transport challenges, transport problems by looking at any specific one single element. When you look at the cooperative systems, and for example, you compare Europe and the US, in the US, the main driver publicly presented for cooperative systems is safety. When we look at it in Europe, you heard uh, my bosses from the European Commission, but also, also uh, colleagues here at this table. It's, it's not only the question of safety, it's also a question of efficiency, it's a question of making transport cleaner. I think we should be aware that when we look at road safety, human factor is the element number one that is the, 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 the reason for accidents, which means we, we 
can and we have to work on the technological aspects. We have to make cars more safer, we have to make infrastructure safer, we have to make sure that regulation is there, but we also need to look at people. But that also means, and I really like what, what Herman said about car not being a smartphone on four wheels. Even if we get the most connected car, the most intelligent car, and we solve all those issues related to communication and we'll have the in-vehicle safety systems and outside vehicle safety system in, in place, we still will need to remember that there's a lot that we humans can, uh, can impact uh, when it comes to safety. And for that reason, I think this, this human element, not only from the point of view of public acceptance, but also education, will be extremely important when we are looking at the future of cooperative systems in Europe. Um, and do you think, I mean, because there are various parts of the Commission involved, do you think that the Commission can move at the pace that is necessary? I mean, do we need a better connected Commission as well as a connected car? I mean, if you think about um, the, the time that it's taken for equal to, to get, get off the ground, um, and clearly, you know, the technology is there, the, the, the will is there in the, with the uh, car manufacturers, but they need standards, they need support systems, and can it work at, at, at a a fast enough pace. Um, how much time do we have to discuss the European Commission here and how much, uh, how much uh, the audience will be interested to, to listen to that? But uh, oh, possibly. <laughs> I, actually, I actually don't think we are that disconnected. C contrary to what the story out there in town normally is, it's true, ECOL has taken longer time than we all would like it to. But on the other hand, ECOL is the first example of a sort of cooperative system in place. And let's be honest, we had to test what needs to be done to make it happen on the part of administration, on the part of vehicle, on the part of, of the uh, mobile connection. I assume what each next system thinks will be easier, but it's also true that in the world that is so much technology oriented, it is a new area for the Commission to learn to work in. We cannot anymore work like we used to 20 years ago when we came up with a solution, we put it into the legislation, we said this is what has to happen, and then the world, or Europe at least, or part of Europe at least, made, made it happen. Now we need to, that's why we are already working in a different way. You, you heard a lot today about the need to work with stakeholders in partnership with the member states and whether different fora that had been in place before or the cooperative ITS uh, platform that we launched is exactly about that, that we first work with you, with national authorities, with local authorities, we decide what is needed and we choose very carefully where we as the Commission step in, because sometimes we don't need to step in. We don't need to come up with strong legislation. We can go either via standardization or we can go through measures supporting deployment or supporting some research projects. But I think the biggest challenge we do have in the, in the Commission, and in particular in this whole digital technological dimension is indeed how to make sure that we, we do not stop innovation from happening, but we also create a framework where that innovation is happening in the right manner, taking into account all those public concerns, uh, privacy of data, security, safety, availability of technological solutions, accessibility of techn technological solutions. Well, quite clearly, there are a lot of huge issues, and, and I, I accept that. And, and I think it will come back. I'm sure that people will have questions about where the Commission should uh, draw the line in terms of, of regulation and what. But so we'll come back to that in a little a little later. But thank you, um, Jacques Anselm, CEO of Allianz Telematics. Now, the insurance industry already way way ahead here. You're, you've got your black boxes in in cars, and young drivers are being being uh, yeah, followed, but absolutely. with their... Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in your company. Well, what we're doing in our company is that we are currently fitting, retrofitting, actually, telematics devices in vehicles uh, to provide not only better insurance rates, but also to provide uh, what we call value-added services, location-based services. So we, we heard a lot about emergency calls. So I mean, we heard a lot that emergency calls can save lives. 
Actually, I can tell you, it does save lives. We have already saved maybe three or four lives so of you, our customers. So not, you're not just tracking um, young drivers' speed and things. You no, also no, no, have, no, a, have no. A, your own e-call type system. Absolutely. We believe that tele telematics, actually connected car, is a, a way to enhance and to improve the driving of our customers and to make them save money at the same, at the same time. So it is, it is really a, a virtual circle. I think that everybody can get something out of this. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, reducing emissions. We heard a lot about um, improving the security and the safety of the drivers. And um, we have tangible examples of that. We have also uh, an example of reducing crime. We have not heard about that, but reducing and helping fighting crime. So uh, our record to recover stolen car between the, the theft, the actual theft, and the recovery, including putting the thieves in jail, was 20 minutes. So uh, <laughs> that, that actually works. That's actually and very how, efficient. And how widespread are, are your, um, your telematic boxes? I mean, how many people are using them? Well, we currently are close to 250,000 customers connected in Europe with our, with our system. And obviously here, uh, we've been talking a lot about cooperation and working together. Um, well, insurance companies today have to put telematics boxes in cars because most cars are not equipped. We saw very teeny tiny number. Yeah, so what uh, happens when cars all become connected? Exactly, well, when cars will become connected, that's when I think uh, we will have to sit all together around the table and agree on how to set up the famous uh, business model that uh, Frank was mentioning before. I think there is one, there is a solution. We have been having lots of discussions, very interesting discussions with Herman and the, at Ertico. And um, basically, if we all get together, we all agree on the model to exchange data. Uh, I'm not gonna get boring into the technical details here, but there are ways to achieve it fairly quickly and fairly simply. Okay, well, thank you. Um, do we have some questions at all from, from the audience? We've got, we have a microphone that... Yes, we have uh, uh, somebody there. Where is the microphone, actually, the, for the audience? Thank you. Should I stand up? Or please, if you wouldn't mind, and say where you're from, please. Uh, my name's Laurel Henning. I'm a journalist with MLEX. Um, I have a question for Magda, if I may. Um, the Commission mentioned earlier that you would be uh, coming forward with a, a roadmap on the deployment of the connected car. Obvious question, you can see you nodding. I was just wondering uh, when the timing of that might be. Would it be sometime next year, and if so, when? Or, or further away than that? Thank you. That was, that was e easy and not totally unexpected. <laughs> Although, yeah, we put that sentence in the speech of the Director General, so it's even easier for us uh, to answer. Uh, but uh, seriously speaking, obviously you know that this is the, the start point of the new commission. So first and foremost, I need to make a reservation, I think is the word, that the work program for the next year is to be adopted in the next couple of weeks. So there you will know for sure about all the major legislative initiatives that the Commission will, will come up with. However, with regards to the roadmap for the deployment of ITS, it is, it is a title we came up with exactly because we've been discussing with a number of various uh, stakeholders from various both automotive but also uh, authority side, also uh, people related to the um, to the security and safety of of, uh, of uh, ICT and applications for several months, and we realized that the scope of work or scope of topics that we have to look into is is indeed very wide. So that's why we launched this uh, cooperative ITS platform that started working a month ago. The, meeting, the next round of meetings is actually yesterday and today, and they will be meeting every month. And what we'd like to come up with is in approximately 14 months, a bit of a vision strategy document. It will not be yet a document that will say, this and this will, will happen in a year or two or three. It will be more a document that will that should point to who needs to do what and when for the deployment of, of cooperative ITS. And maybe one, one, one word of caution here. Uh, 
we know that CITS is happening, and it's happening in Europe, and there are pilot uh, projects, and there is deployment along the ITS corridor. But what is important from the point of view of the Commission is that we try we build a framework where CITS can happen Europe-wide. Because if you look back 15, 20 years ago at the intelligent transport systems, what was happening, they were developing in uh, very often a bit uh, separated or disconnected manner in Europe. And you had those centers of ITS excellence and centers of uh, ITS non-excellence, if I can put it like that, or lack of ITS excellence. and. And you heard it from 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 uh, people in in the car uh, industry itself. For cooperative ITS to happen, you need to have the whole system addressed. You need to have a situation when cars can connect and talk to one another, and they can also talk to infrastructure, and they can do it regardless of the car make. Because otherwise, we will be looking at some sort of uh, secluded proprietary systems that will not really enhance safety, that will not really enhance efficiency, and that, as an end result, can actually be a bit counterproductive. And equal was mentioned, I think one, uh, one big uh, discussion point about eco was actually how to address the question of having eco available in any car in Europe and that car being able to communicate with any emergency system no matter where in Europe and we like it or not it is 28 member states and it is complicated and it will be complicated C can I just ask um, Martin and Pim from the industry what would you like to see in this roadmap how involved do you want to see the the, the European Commission I mean, you know, we're seeing in the States, haven't they mandated connectivity? I mean, how far do you want the EU to the European Commission to take this? In the States, they're going to mandate. They have set a timeline for that. To. So it is from 2020 onwards. The result of that will be that from that time on, uh, the, the penetration rate, that percentage of vehicles with the system will go much, much faster as that we do it voluntary or it's optional on our vehicles. Well, which, is, which would you prefer? I mean, so in general, of course, we would prefer to have a technology uh, timeline and, and do it, you know, without legislations. You know, to be honest, I would say for equal, it's it's time for some something else. And uh, again, we have equal in most of our cars today, and uh, it's time to have it in all cars. So, what do you need? What do you need from the Commission then? Thank you. <laughs> That's, that's a good question, I guess. We, need the, we have really good cooperation today, and I don't see that we have a huge need for a change there. Okay, can, I, can I just say that this is, this is something that I've seen uh, very often, and maybe that just confirms that, yes, we are ready to listen to you, so do tell us what you expect from us, and then we'll tell you what is possible, what is not, and when the things that are not possible now can be made possible. But, but we know it comes from cooperative ITS is an extremely complex and wide area. And I also understand that for the automotive industry, it is also looking at things not only from the EU perspective, but obviously from the global perspective. So yes, we understand that. But thank you for this reaction. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, yes, Herman. I mean, within uh, the ethical partnership, we are currently working on, on, on this type of roadmap. We call it program. And uh, there, um, we have identified different topics. One topic is interoperability. Uh, concerning interoperability, a lot of work has already happened. Um, now the focus really has to be on, on testing. There might be uh, also a need for work on uh, conformancy assessment. I mean, that might also be something. Uh, technology, we see that a lot of focus so far was on short-range communication. Uh, we believe that there is a need for the future really to include all communication technologies in our thinking. That is short-range communication, cellular com communication and broadcast communication. We need, uh, uh, we need to see that uh, the services are provided by the most appropriate technology. We should be technology agnostic. We need some work concerning some real policy measures, uh, especially when we link the cooperative ITS topic to automation, there will be issues in the context of uh, liability. Later, very important issue will be security. Uh, it's very good to have uh, a session here which focuses on this issue. That's a major issue which needs a lot of attention. 
procurement, especially in the context of the infrastructure side. We work uh, within the partnership also on pre-commercial procurement concepts so that we, take, we reduce a bit the risk for the ones who develop these technologies and these services so that already the procurement is done actually before the service is actually uh, developed so that they get just the functionality and they can work towards achieving this functionality and then things will be uh, procured. And certainly the issue concerning international cooperation is very important. We want at least interoperability European-wide, but we would like, if possible, also to see that it's as global as possible, as far as it is possible and does not make us slower. I think that is something which is also very important, yeah? because global cooperation, I can tell you, that's tough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, gentleman here. Do, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Joost van Tommer from Fabiak, so I'm playing house here in the automotive industry in Belgium. We see a lot of initiatives in smart cities projects, like in the, in the Nordics, but also in the southern countries. Belgium is also starting with some of them. I'm just wondering about the DG Move. Um, we have scoreboards and we have Eurobarometers of DG Sanko on consumer habits, consumer patterns, and what they expect. Uh, did you listen to the drivers and the consumer side of this? This is very much technology driven from the producer point of view, from our members. What is the consumer asking, actually, instead of just copy-pasting apps into the car? That's not the purpose. But does he have any real expectations of that and, and opportunities? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually have, uh, I don't have uh, exact numbers now concerning uh, the question of corporates of ITS, and it's, it's a valid point, but I'm just a bit worried that um, if you want to have results out of consumer surveys, you really need to make sure that your audience or your, those who, whom you're asking are really well educated and they understand what you're asking. And I think there's still a lot of confusion what is cooperative ITS or what is automated car. So we, we really need to ask questions differently. But one uh, piece of data which I actually have is uh, that nine out of 10 Europeans are actually concerned uh, that mobile app applications are collecting their data without their consent. And then seven out of 10 Europeans are concerned about the potential use that companies may make of the information disclosed. And that, I think, these will be the type of questions we'll need to ask because cooperative ITS is absolutely 100% related and, and, and linked to the question of access to our data, access to information that we consciously have uh, shared with the car, but also access to data related to the car itself. Which I is, obviously, we will talk more about that in, in I think, in the next panel, but it, obviously it is a, a key, th key thing, I can see that. I, I, I like this, this statement earlier today about the fact, I think it came from the CEO of Renault, that we will be developing even closer relationship with our car, but I think it's really it's really worrying because uh, the level of of consciousness and uh, awareness that cooperative ITS will uh, require uh, will really put a heavy burden uh, on the side not only of the car producers or the services providers, but also public authorities. And I think this is something that we really need to make sure that, that they start thinking about, which is why, for example, in this platform that I've been talking about for a while, we also invited member states to be in it, because again, it is also something that, that authorities will need to take into consideration. We've got a question from Jean-Yves Jolt. Uh, he says, is there an assessment of the potential for job creation in Europe from the deployment of the connected car? Um, do, I mean, do, Herman, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I cannot give you a figure, uh, but I, I think that come, I would like to come back what I, what I said before. Um, I think uh, it's not a question that we will see deployment of cooperative ITS uh, in Europe. I mean, there's no question about it, and, and there are lots of policy goals which can be achieved with it. 
uh, I think the big question which we have at the moment is where do these technologies and services come from in the future? And I can tell you that is my main concern. I want that Europe is strong on it. And to be strong on it, we need economies of scale because that is the big advantage of a country like China. They develop a service and when they can sell it throughout China, they have a huge market. Then after they have gained this market, they come to Europe and then they come to the US or the other, uh, the other way around. With the US, it's a similar situation. So if we achieve this interoperability of services throughout Europe, then we create economies of scale. If we create a situation where we have the appropriate data access and service access throughout Europe, if we have a common approach to it, we have economies of scale. And then we will have a lot of high technology jobs. We are very strong in transportation. I think the, Euro uh, the strength of Europe lies in transportation. Vehicle manufacturing, we are also very strong concerning public transport. We were strong concerning telecommunication. There, unfortunately, we are not strong anymore. So, I think that now we have to create this strength concerning ITS and connectivity. So, Martin and Pim, I mean, do, what, do you think that you can hold your own? Because, you know, you are car makers, you're not... IT specialists as such. I mean, it, it changes the sort of the, 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 your core business in a way, doesn't it? Um, are you up to the job? I mean, or, or are we going to see competition coming from elsewhere taking over? I, I think we will probably see both. I mean, obviously, we're strengthening our, our competence in IT and we have partners in that space as well. Um, but, you know, looking at other industries where similar industries, then there will be over the top players that come you know, and take part of the business and, and part of the responsibility as well. So I, I expect both. Mm. Yeah, it's the same for us. We, we don't directly see uh, the use of data as a, as a business for Ford. We're looking into that, but we want to enable our customers to, to give their data to other parties and make it interesting for them to supply the data to them. And we need to make that technology available that they can do that. So then for them, there could be a, a financial interest to, to provide the data to external parties and maybe to Ford. Did you and one thing must be clear, the, the owner of that data is the customer. He decides yes. what is done with the data. Jack. Yeah, that's a, a point I wanted to make before when I was saying we're putting the boxes in the cars is, is because this is no, but, I'm sorry. When I was saying that we're, we have to fit the boxes in the cars, I mean, we, everybody understands that that's not the business of an insurance company to get into this. So we are also expecting our friends, the car makers, the car industry, to fit to a larger scale, uh, but also to be able to recover much better their investment. And then I'm joining again uh, Herman in the fact that the scale economy will be achieved through open systems and open access to several stakeholders. Thank you. Um, gentlemen here and then behind you. Thierry, Thierry Van Ken, Fabiak. Uh, I have a question of maybe an advice for the Commission. Don't you think you have taken a very difficult way by taking the e-call as the first killing application in that connected car problem? You know, connection is emission and reception. And normally it's always the, the emission side who, has, who is in command. Think about the GPS. The emission came from the satellite. There were not a lot of discussion of what about the system, etc. So maybe having an application as, for example, the road signs application would be a better idea to start with because there you are in command. Thank you. Obviously too late Too now. late, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, but I think um, it was, uh, it actually is a proof that at the outset, if we, if we all agree that equal was the birth of sort of cooperative systems, that at the outset we all really thought safety first. And that's why something related to emergency, to assisting in the case of an accident came as the, as the most pressing and urgent, and urgent uh, problem. And, I mean, 
I think the difficulty that was there, I'm not sure that it would have been that greatly diminished with road signs because the difficulty really put, came with what will be always coming with regards to cooperative systems, that you need to put several players together and make sure that things happen in parallel, that you don't have a linear thing, we do one thing now and the next one next year, that, that all three elements have to be in place for the system to work. And can I just comment on that? Because oh, yeah. I, I agree with Magna on this, and, and you also have to look at you know where you get most bang for the buck, because you know obviously equal saves lives, and the road sign detection information is something that we can do. I wouldn't say easily that, but we can do it with cameras and stuff in in the car today, and you know a lot of cars like ours are offering it today in the cars. Yeah. So. You know, where, where can you get the most leverage? And, and, and Jack, I, your system has yeah, already saved uh, lives. And, and, and if, if I may add as well, um, don't think ECOL is the most complex use case to be implemented. ECOL is actually probably, and the way it's been implemented... Can you put, put the microphone a little closer? Sorry, yeah. I, I, was, I was saying, don't think that ECOL is the most complex use case. It might, may sound the most important one, but it's not the most complex. Uh, the, the road signs basically would be something that would draw much more complexity in implementing the infrastructure. So with ECOL, we had lots of, lots of components already in place. And it is, of course, also the one which has the strongest impact. My name is Jeff, Jeff Seisler from Clean Fuels Consulting here in town. Uh, cars are getting smarter, drivers are not. Cars are getting safer, drivers are more distracted, accidents are going up. How is the interface between the connected car and all this information coming in going to work directly with the drivers to actually promote safety as opposed to promoting distraction? Very good question, yes. Um, now, tell us, tell us. What, what, I mean, let's go, let's everybody get some sense. I mean, how are the, uh, yeah, is this? I, I actually like that you bring up driver distraction. I think that's, uh, you know, kind of step one in, in when we talk about connected services. Because we do, you know, add more and more services to the car, and there's apps and all that. And so how do you kind of counter the driver distraction that comes with that? And, and part of the answer is that, well, you know, if we don't answer, uh, offer these services, then the user will bring up their mobile phone and use that instead, which is worse. Uh, hopefully we can do better than worse. Um, so uh, there are several ways to, to tackle driver distraction. One is using uh, human machine interfaces that are as intu intuitive as possible. You can use voice interaction. You can also use driver assist systems like line keeping aids and so on um, to make sure that the, the customer puts the attention where it's most needed. Again, I don't think there's any silver bullet. We need to work on this. I think that in general, if you look at the systems that are out there in terms of connected apps and so on, uh, you know, we can all do better, definitely. Yeah, well, the, the point I wanted to add uh, from, uh, from the insurance point of view, I think a very good incentive for the customer to drive better also is the potential saving it can achieve uh, while driving better and driving less, driving really when he needs to. Uh, maybe use public transportation when he, when he needs to. And uh, there are lots of examples already in UK, for example, for the young driver, lots of programs that have been launched by insurance companies about providing feedback, not only to the driver, but also to the parents, helping them to drive better, avoid risky areas, and, and basically uh, um, improve basically the overall quality. It's not only about selecting the best drivers and giving them a, a better rate, some premium, but it is also trying to pull up and try to get everybody driving better. So we hope that it will help making drivers better. Yeah, we but think but with a plethora of information potentially, Pim, coming to the driver, um, yeah, how do you make it safe? Yeah, we, we need, it's a big area of research, probably one of the main areas of research. It's not only driven by connectivity, it's also uh, all the active safety driver assist systems we're bringing in. So we're really more and more monitoring what the workload level of the driver is, how we pass the information on, really minimal visual, most of it audible output, voice control, and uh, really controlling out when we pass the information on. Uh, we, we do studies that uh, in the heavy workload of the driver maybe uh, stop incoming phone calls and all that. So it's a large area of research from all the automotive companies. And do you um, plan that a driver could potentially switch it off? 
That is a big discussion point. By the time we get really to full implementation of the DSRC system, and it's a large part of, this, of the safety systems of the vehicle, we probably get to a point where we're then not allowed to, say, to switch off these safety features. Other information, of course, we, we allow the driver to, do, to stop that information coming through to him. Right. Okay. Obviously, we do switch some things off already today. Like, yeah. you know, you can't use the web browser in, in today's cars mm -hmm. when driving and so on. But you know, switching off active safety systems are probably not a great idea. Well, I'm no, sure it's no. not, but I'm just saying, you know, is it possible? And, would, and Herman, you wanted to come in. Maybe two additional uh, aspects. I mean, one aspect is prioritization. So if you have, for instance, a very safety critical information that this gets priority over other uh, information or even infotainment. Uh, and the second aspect is for the future that uh, uh, I think we need some agreements also uh, in the context then, for instance, there will be more and more car sharing also. And then if the HMIs are very, very different between different brands. I think that can also have an aspect to make it less safe, yeah, because you always, the customer, the user has to get used to a different HMI. Having said this, the HMI is also for the different brands a distinct, distinguishing factor. It's really about uh, their business case, yeah, so it's also a very sensitive issue. Magda? Maybe a slightly different aspect, but I started by saying that we really need to look at car as, as part of the transport system. And I actually believe that, uh, okay, with, with the cooperative ITS, we, we are aiming at improving safety, we are aiming at improving or making the cars cleaner by improving the efficiency of their use. But let's not deceive ourselves. Uh, in, the, in the years to come, the number of cars in the streets will not dramatically disappear good for the automotive industry, obviously, but not necessarily so good for the transport system itself. And what I think will or could happen when, 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 the, when the little car in which we sit is better connected to the outside world, on the one hand, during those 92 hours in the traffic jam, we, to do, we can do shopping online uh, and ask for delivery uh, to home, but we can also make, uh, we can predict more our traveling situation and basically knowing that something is happening ahead and that there is a parking spot, we'll simply leave the car there and change for another transport mode or we'll walk or we'll rent a, a, rent a bike. Because for me, the biggest advantage of the CITS is indeed making car a more connected part of the transportation system and connecting all the modes in cities in particular, but not only for that, also for long distance <coughs> travels. Okay. A gentleman here has a question. My name is uh, Leo Bingham from the Sims Foundation Holland. Um, when I hear the discussion about ITS uh, this afternoon, um, I think it, it's largely um, supplier-driven and policy-driven. And uh, I recognize that because in Holland that's much the same. Uh, I would ask the, the panel um, in general, uh, where do they think uh, the consumer comes in? Uh, what does the consumer want, uh, 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 and where will he be uh, willing be, uh, to, uh, to pay for at the end? Because we all want to earn a few, uh, a few euros. So where does demand and supply come together? Okay, let's get back to that issue. Um, do consumers know what they want, Martin? I mean, or do you take the IKEA approach that you tell us what, what we want before we know it? Is that the Volvo approach as well, the Swedish No, approach? it's probably not. Uh, you know, uh, will the consumer pay for it? I, again, I don't see the consumer paying for uh, cooperative ITS per se, but it, yes, there is a willingness to pay for safety features that we build upon these technologies. Yes, there is. I mean, we see with our active safety systems today that, that there is a willingness to, to pay for that, yes. But, it, I mean, if it becomes the norm within a vehicle, then people aren't going to want to, want, aren't going to, want to pay extra, are they? Well, obviously, if it's, if it's the norm and if everybody has it, then it's not something you would want to pay extra for. But, I mean, we have that evolution with everything we build in the cars. Today's cars have lots of features that's a standard that was extra, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, that's part of the evolution, so that's, I don't see that as a problem. No. What about you, from Ford's yeah, the, point of view? Definitely you? there's a willingness to pay for safety systems. We see even on our, on our low-end cars like Fiesta, uh, quite high take rates of, of safety packages. 
Uh, and then there's the other uh, convenience features. Yeah? Uh, some people will be willing to pay for parking reservation, automatic payment, and features like that. So we need to offer more and more of those uh, features that are interesting for certain types of customers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but again, if we open the market, then you will have much richer set of features accessible by the customers. So we, again, if we talk about the customers, are they willing to pay? If, like today, they have access to just a certain set of features and services which are brought together with the car, versus tomorrow having access basically to an entire ecosystem, it makes a lot more sense for them as well to, to pay for the basic connectivity or to have a connected car by itself. Magda, how do you see this, the business model developing? That's clearly a question, number one, that we all need to have an answer to in regards to corporate ITS. Uh, I won't tell you what, uh, what is the business model that we believe will exist, but one of the questions that we are looking into as policy makers, and that's probably a question where it would be interesting, very interesting for us to hear back from you. We are often being asked, when you're talking about deployment of CITS, should it concern everybody or should you go for a specific type? Should you go for trucks first? As you know, for many, for many solutions uh, introduced at the European level, we, we, we did start with, with, uh, with trucks. And uh, the, well, the, the instant re reaction would be probably not again because cooperative ITS is cooperative and it is connected and it, it needs to concern all uh, participants uh, of, the, of the road, uh, all, all those who, who move on the roads. But I think that uh, a question not to forget when we look at users and when we ask ourselves what it is that they can or will be willing to pay for, we need to make sure that they know what they are paying for. So we are back down to the question of awareness and knowledge and that if they agree for something, they know what they've agreed for and what are the risks and what it will uh, mean in terms, again, I'm coming back to the same topic, privacy of data, information. It is a question, for example, when you're looking into the insurance issue, people need to know what it means that they agree for the, for the travel in the car being followed uh, and even if they get something in return, again, it's very important that they do it f with full consciousness. Um, yes, I mean, from your work, to how aware do you think people are at all of these issues so far? I mean, first of all, uh, almost in all the activities we, we are doing, we also ask about uh, what the user wants, how he values the different services. And I'm not so worried about that there will not be users who will be prepared to pay money. But I think it's more complex than this. And I would like to use uh, e-call as an example. Because at the beginning, I, I described this scenario that the e-call goes to the next piece hub. It can go, the information can go to the next vehicles. Uh, so you can have also emergency braking. And it can go to vehicles which are further away. And it can go to the traffic management centers. There are lots of users who benefit from it. There are also different companies who have to cooperate to deliver the services. They all want to have a profitable situation. So it's very, very complex. Yeah? We cannot simplify it just by saying, do the users want to have these different services? There, I tell you, easy, yes. There, I'm completely convinced. But how we bring everything together, I think that is the challenge. So how do you, <laughs> have you any ideas? No, I think this is happening. Uh, the industry, the, I mean, uh, if there's money to be earned, you, you can be sure that business is working on it. I mean, all these companies working uh, day and night uh, on creating these business cases, there will be these business cases, and you see it already today that connectivity comes into the vehicles. I mean, yeah. there, is, yeah. there is already connectivity. Yeah. It's now with the cellular systems. Now it will also be in the future with the, with the short-range communication. It's, it's not the question, will it happen? Yes, it will happen. Will it happen relatively fast? I tell you, yes. It will re uh, happen relatively fast, but still there are major, major things, major work which has to be done. 
And if I may just come up with one thing, because I again fell into the same trap. When we talk users of the cooperative systems, let's not forget that this is not only all of us as individual passengers in the cars. There's a huge area where cooperative systems will work, and there, of course, they can be a bit more advanced. When we talk about delivery of goods, and it's delivery of goods in trucks, but that's delivery of goods in uh, light v. v in, in smaller trucks and in individual cars. So what I'm talking about is users who are also business people. And for them, the impact and the effect and the uh, benefit of cooperative system is obvious because for, for them, the efficiency and planning and improving uh, the, the smoothness of their road operations is crucial. And it is very easily calculated. It can be very easily calcu calcu calculated. 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 Calculated, calculated into 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 uh, into into money and profits, and but again we need to look at cooperative systems as, as as a system. So we need to bear in mind both types of users of the roads. Martin, you wanted to come. Yes, I do. Uh, and I think we need also to remember that I mean the connected car and these features that we're building and the infrastructure that we're building can be leveraged for other things as well. And you know, autonomous driving is obviously kind of the next step here. And autonomous driving offers value to both to the authorities because you can fit more cars on the roads, but also to the users because we free up time to, to the users to do other things. So uh, it, I'm not sure that it has to be all, you know, the whole investment has to be covered by making safer cars only. There's other values too. Okay. Do we have... Any other questions? We had a question, a question that was on Twitter before. Oh, here it is. What are the relevant open standards for connected cars? Which is from Friedgo Muska. Um, what are the relevant open standards for connected cars? Uh, <laughs> anybody? Many. Many. <laughs> well, that, no, you're not. Don't all rush at once to answer the question. <laughs> no, I, 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 I could not even tell you all of them. Yeah, uh, I think the the challenge with the with the standards is that there are many standardization bodies working on it, and for <laughs> us the challenge is really to make ends meet. Yeah, because we don't want that they all go in different directions, and we want to really avoid a situation like we have with tolling. With tolling, we have uh, on the trucks you have maybe five, six different equipment for the tolling in Europe. We don't want to have this in Europe. Uh, and we would like to have even a situation where we have uh, a more harmonized approach uh, then between uh, at least Europe, uh, US and uh, Japan, hopefully also China. Do you have anything, Magdo, no, to add? No? No. The only thing I can add in terms of tolling, although I'm not going to start that discussion, is that this is not a question of technology for trucks. I mean, we could... I as, as in many issues, this is not so much a technology question, it's more a policy question, and I will stop here. <laughs> if there, are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, we have just one final question here, and then I, I want to ask you all just a, a, a one question to, to sum up. So my name is uh, Ludovic Privat, I'm uh, editor of GPS Business News. Just one question regarding the business model and the value. Uh, one name has been not, not been pronounced today, it's Google. Uh, so I'm sure the, the, the car makers are aware of that. So how do we make sure that the value created by the connected car stay in Europe and not living to Mountain View, California? Okay, it's a good point. I was going to say, Google never heard of it, but uh, we have had some discussions, yes. Uh, again, as I said earlier, you know, if you look at the other industries, like the telecom industry, where you try to build and protection around your data and uh, there will be over the top players uh, that will offer use that data and find ways to to leverage that data in other ways uh, i think one of the key takeouts from this discussion is that we we need to open up our data from the cars and we need to do that in a corporate way uh, i don't see google as a, as an adversary in the, in this sense they offer lots of very valuable services to our customers and also to their customers and uh, it's going to be a cooperative solution. How worrying? Should, how worried should we be, though? I mean, we, no. sh we should not be worried about Google. We no, no, we're not worried at all about Google. They have an interest in this data, but again, they must make it interesting to our customers to to get access to the data. 
And uh, I think they're developing business ideas, what they can do with all that uh, floating car data. Mm -hmm. But there's other players, not the only player around. Sure, yeah. Uh, Herman, yeah? The only thing I can say to this is, I think we have to achieve a level playing field, mm -hmm. that everybody has the same chances. Because you see now that the, the strategy of some companies is that from the strengths of a certain market segment, you enter the next market segment, and for others it's very difficult to compete. And, and that is something which needs some attention. And also what we discussed today concerning this market access, service access, I think this will also provide, at the end, very small companies to provide services. I think we, will, we have to create an ecosystem with very small creative companies who provide services and applications. Okay, so let me just to finish off, ask you all the same question, and I really need a very brief answer to this, but just a 30 second response. But what would your top priority be to ensure safe and clean mobility in tomorrow's cars? So really the, you know, the, the key thing that is gonna make a difference if, if, if you only had a magic wand for one thing. So Martin. And, and, and with the risk of repeating myself, it's this open ecosystem and it's all about sharing data between different uh, OEMs. We need to get to that, uh, to that spot where we're able to do that and we need to uh, share that data in a way that's still secure and safe um, both in terms of you know, data security and hackers, but also in terms of privacy of our customers. And obviously that leads nicely into our discussion later uh, after the coffee break, but Pim. It's, it's always difficult, I'm always the second automotive OEM. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry, I should have come to you first, it's not fair, is it? But, uh, <laughs> but, but the drive is really uh, to get those systems into the vehicles now as quickly as possible and, and get more and more feature content out for, for our customers. Okay, Herman. I fully agree with Martin concerning the ecosystem and, and uh, data access issue. Um, and I also agree with Pim. Yeah? I think the money goes where the market is. We need quick deployment because then really money goes into the business and more and more will develop and, and we get really creativity. Okay. Like that. Easy, I already said that it's a question of cooperation and making sure that all relevant actors, and here I mean all relevant actors, not just the automotive industry, not just the ICT industry, but also decision makers, polit politicians, local and national authorities, that they all show uh, enough attention to the question of cooperative systems. And Jack, from the, your insurance perspective. Same thing, same thing, definitely. <laughs> we need to open the market as soon as possible as quickly as possible. Okay, fine. Well, thank you very much. Yes. That just left everybody with some good thoughts to go off and have coffee. And then we're going to come back and have our second panel discussion on security, which of course we've already touched upon a little bit, but thank you. Thank you very much indeed.